Hello everyone. Welcome to our webinar on nutrition and its role in liver health. My name is Bethany Dorfler and I'm a clinical research dietitian in the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at Northwestern. And I'm thrilled to be with you today to talk to you a little bit about some of the best things that you can work on for improving your liver health and perhaps also suggesting some topics that you may want to consider when you're meeting with your hepatologist or your physician next time. So on our plate today, I want to cover a few core topics to guide our discussion, such as what do our patients see? What do you see when you're searching the internet and you're looking for diet advice on diet and liver health? It's important for us to also consider what Americans are typically doing. What are we typically eating? How are we exercising? And what influence does that have on the health of our liver? And the flip side of that, of course, is how do we kind of change some of our American ways, if you will, to improve our liver health? We wanted specifically to focus on fatty liver and ways that we could improve fatty liver for uh, those of you who are listening, if you've been diagnosed with fatty liver or if you have a family or friend um, uh, who has fatty liver, we wanted to really give you some specific dietary advice. And then also, um, I wanted to share with you some questions that clients often will ask me. Things like, you know, should I do a juice cleanse? Should I be taking probiotics? What about certain vitamins, specific vitamins? How about herbal therapies? So we'll take a look at answering all of these questions today. I did a short search and found, you know, over a million topics that we could look at for nutrition and liver health. And I'm, I quickly appreciate how easily overwhelming it can be to do a nutrition search on nutrition and liver health and try to come up with some very you know, succinct and directed ideas on what to eat and how to eat. These are just a few of the topics that I found on one of the websites that I found, and of course there are many, many others. But often consumers who have liver disease or fatty liver have been suggest it's been suggested that you consider doing a juice cleanse, that you eat either a high fiber diet, a low protein diet, maybe that you use some anti-inflammatory supplements such as things like turmeric uh, or uh, that specific foods like broccoli or sweet potatoes or apples or even using apple cider vinegar can help to kind of clean your liver. And some of these are actually good solid advice and are core principles of a healthy diet. Some of these are also kind of oversimplifications of the lifestyle modifications that we need to make. Uh, generally when I was doing a search on this, uh, as if I were a patient looking for diet and nutrition advice, I didn't see too many uh, completely far out there uh, suggestions on what I should eat or how I should be eating. But in general, we need to make sure that our patients are doing both diet and exercise. And when I was searching on the internet, I found that usually patients who were looking up liver health didn't get enough information on doing diet and exercise together. So I'd love for you to keep that in mind when you're working with your hepatologists or your physicians on how to really integrate or develop a lifestyle change program that comes up with both diet exercise advice. So before we can get into what we should be eating and how we should be exercising, I need to give you a kind of state of the union address, so to speak, on nutrition and exercise. We need to really dive into the role that diet and lifestyle and exercise plays on liver health and what we can do to kind of change it around. What I will tell you is that lifestyle change and diet and exercise are often considered by physicians as first-line therapy for dealing with diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol, uh, insulin resistance, all of these things that contribute to fatty liver. You know as well as I do from the 1990s to today that America has struggled with weight gain. 
it's happening to our children and it's happening to us as adults. So in 1990, less than 15% of many states in the U.S. reported having overweight and obese, obese adults. Ten years later only, that number jumped to about 20 to 25 percent of Americans. And by the time we hit 2014, we had several states where more than a third of the residents living in those states struggled with overweight and obesity. And the consequences of this um, are important when we consider liver health because Exercise and diet are two essential tools to keep the liver healthy, and we'll talk about more, more of that in a minute. So with regard to physical activity, when we're looking at the State of the Union for physical activity, 28% uh, of Americans who are 50 and older state that they don't get any activity at all, no walking, um, no exercise at all outside of uh, their work life. And, of course, our clients here really struggle with trying to find that work-life balance of working, um, family time, and trying to fit in exercise and taking care of themselves. That's one of the things that a registered dietitian or a doctor could do with you is really sit down and help you carve out your game plan and help you strategize about how you are going to fit, develop some exercise uh, or develop an exercise protocol that will match your lifestyle. At the end of this talk, I have some really specific and targeted suggestions for you as well. The problem with lack of exercise is that when we don't move our muscles, when we don't get our heart rate up, our bodies have a tendency to store fat around our midsection. So as we gain weight and we become inactive, the fat around our midsection or around our bellies oftentimes we think of as directly harming the heart and directly harming the liver. We know that the fat around your midsection actually really contributes to high blood sugars, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, and ultimately to fatty liver. So I don't need my patients to be a perfect weight, but I do encourage my clients to focus on not only eating healthy foods, but also weight loss, good blood sugar control, and developing a physical activity plan that works for them. And I'll show you some really specific strategies for that as we continue with this talk. I want to show you an update on where we as Americans are getting some of our calories from. It, I always enjoy talking with clients about uh, what they feel that some of their diet struggles are. You know, many of our patients feel like they're too busy, they're tired. Uh, because they're so busy, they oftentimes will rely on dining out or getting something really quick from a restaurant uh, for dinner, and they feel like they're not doing as much homemade food. Uh, some of my clients also report that there are many more opportunities to snack on wonderful things in their office. You know that it's always somebody's birthday at work. There's always a birthday cake or bagels in the office. So these are some very real issues that I think our clients really struggle with and maybe some of you struggle with as well. As you can see in this slide, from the 1970s to today, uh, and actually the last time that this data was calculated was 2008, um, Americans are consuming more than 700 calories now a day than we did in the 1970s. Interestingly, we're not necessarily eating more fruits and vegetables or you know, lean proteins or, or milk. That has kind of stayed relatively stable, maybe a little bit more dairy products. But we're eating a little bit more fat and we're eating a lot more starchy foods than we used to before. So what do I mean by starchy foods? Starchy foods are found on this next slide here. So here are the top sources of calories. Those 700 extra calories that we just talked about, here's where they're coming from. Most of us as Americans are getting our, our extra calories from grain-based desserts, you know, things like cakes and cookies, pastries, bagels, donuts. 
granola bars. We're also getting uh, more calories from yeasted breads or breaded chicken dishes, you know, fried chicken fingers, casseroles with noodles, sandwich uh, options. And then the other really big one besides pizza are those sugar-sweetened beverages, sodas, sports drinks, uh, vitamin waters, etc. If you could walk away from today's talk with one specific nutrition tool, if you could remember only one strategy to walk away from today's talk with, I would tell you that the, one of the best things that you can do for your liver, your heart, and your overall health is to completely avoid drinking sweetened beverages. So that would mean no regular soda, uh, no sweet tea, I would watch out for coffee drinks that can be really laden with sugars, and watch out for sports drinks too. Things like Gatorade and vitamin water and some of these energy drinks look like they are really energizing and rehydrating, but oftentimes they have a lot of sugar. There is a role for some sports drinks in athletes that are doing extensive exercise on hot days. But for most of us who are adding 10, 20, 30 minutes of exercise, our bodies really simply need water. Sometimes my clients will say to me, Beth, water is so boring to drink, what else could I drink? And I would tell you to begin experimenting with some of the uh, carbonated waters like LaCroix or Perrier. I would also tell you to start adding slices of fresh fruit or fresh herbs or uh, cucumbers into your water. Anything to kind of jazz up the uh, flavor of your water. If you are a big juice drinker, although fruit juice can be healthy, we tell clients no more than one cup of fruit juice a day. If you'd like to put a little splash of fruit juice in, a big bottle of water to improve the flavor, that's another great strategy to really drop the sugar content of what you're drinking and improve your hydration. And why does sugar matter? I'll show you in the next slide. Americans are eating and drinking more sugar than ever. As our sugar consumption goes up, this also significantly increases our risk of type 2 diabetes, of being overweight, of having high triglycerides and high cholesterol levels. And while these seem like they're cardiovascular issues, these are actually specifically related to liver health. We know that our patients who uh, have fatty liver also usually are juggling managing good blood sugars or they're managing trying to control cholesterol and high blood pressure. So rather than our clients feeling like they need to be on separate diets, I would really like for you to start thinking about the fact that whether you're trying to help your heart or your liver or just your overall wellness, that many of the strategies we're going to discuss today actually will improve all of these things across the board. Some of you may have received the advice from your physician that one of the best things that you can do to help your liver is to better control your blood sugars, or to get your cholesterol under better control, or to lose some weight. So we'll talk a little bit about how to do that. When you're looking at sugar consumption here, you can see that Americans are doing, we're drinking a lot more sugar. 25% of the sugar in our diet comes specifically from soft drinks. If you also look at the little sliver there in the pie chart of fruits and vegetables, what you'll see is that only 1% of the sugar in our diet is coming from fruit and fruit juices. And, you know, if I can, uh, you know, kind of be uh, playful here for a few minutes, sometimes when I talk about eating more fruits and vegetables, one of the things my patients always will say to me is, you know, Beth, maybe I shouldn't have bananas because I hear they're high in sugar, or I'm trying not to eat too much fruit because I know it's kind of high in sugar. And while that may be true for some specific patients who are on insulin and have to really watch the number of sugars in their diet, what I would tell you is that if you're trying to get your liver healthy and your diet healthier overall, I'm not nearly as concerned about the sugars in your diet coming from fruit. One fruit has fiber, which helps to modify sugars. But the other thing is that when we're eating fruit, 
hopefully we're using that to substitute eating other things like donuts or pastries or other things that really actually give us a lot more sugar. And I don't think from looking at the slide that Americans are eating too much fruit. So I would tell you if you're looking for a sweet treat, try fruit first before you try other things. So if we shift gears then and we, we say, okay, I get it, you know, I need to change what I'm eating, I need to exercise more to help my liver, but how do I do that? So I'm going to show you a couple of really specific strategies in these next several slides. The new dietary guidelines have come out uh, and they promote uh, eating more plant-based foods. In general, um, as Americans, I think we eat a lot of meat and we eat a lot of protein food. And while protein is good and helpful, uh, I think our focus really needs to be on getting those fruits and vegetables in there. And the other thing that I want to show you in this slide here is look for ways that you can strip back the processing in your foods. If you would normally eat canned fruit, well, that's okay, I'd try to eat more fresh fruit. If you'd normally have fried chicken, try to have grilled or baked or broiled chicken or chicken that you add into a soup and you boil it. If you're used to having buttered corn or buttered vegetables or vegetables with like a cream sauce or a salad with a creamy dressing, try to go for something that is cooked with just a little bit of olive oil or maybe lemon juice or steamed or has a very, very light dressing on it if you're eating salad because that way you're getting your healthy foods and you're really kind of shaving off some of these fats and calories which could contribute negatively to your liver health. As a dietitian, one thing that I often work on with my clients is helping them set up what we call structured meal plans. I think most of you would agree that you have a general sense of what a healthy item is and how you should be eating healthier. But many of our patients feel like the day just kind of gets away with them, you know, and that their lives get busy and all of a sudden they look up and it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon and they haven't eaten lunch and by that time they're ravenous. So in addition to what we eat, it's important for you to think about how you should be eating. Eating on a schedule is one of the most important things that you can do to improve your liver health because it will help you control your blood sugars and it will help you lose weight. Ultimately, for most of our patients who struggle with fatty liver, a weight loss of approximately 10% is what we advocate for people getting started. 10% is a fantastic way to drop uh, not only blood sugars, lower blood pressure, lower cholesterol, lower body fat. And at that point, your body is also much more sensitized. It's using its insulin much more correctly and efficiently. So 5% so will take, but we usually encourage 5 to 10% of weight loss. To achieve that weight loss, what, here's what I want you to think about visually. Take your plate, like the picture in the bottom right-hand corner, and split it in half. Try to fill half of your plate with some vegetable. It doesn't have to be fresh. It could be a frozen vegetable that you steam. You know, it could be a homemade soup that you're making. Uh, it could be uh, raw vegetables like a salad, for example. Then I want you to take the other half of your plate and divide that into quarters. So one quarter of your plate will have your protein, maybe it's a little lean beef, you know, maybe it's a chicken breast or a piece of fish or some scrambled eggs or some tofu. And then the other quarter of your plate would be some type of whole grain. So we give you some examples here in the start, in the uh, starch category. Whole grains to us count as things like whole wheat pasta, you know, a baked sweet potato, uh, maybe a whole grain tortilla or a bun, uh, or a little bit of brown rice. When you shave, when you orient your plate like this, you are shaving down on portion sizes and you're nailing the calories at your meal because your portion sizes are intact. So let me just review that. Two great strategies here. One. Plan your meals and snacks out. Agree that you're going to put yourself on an eating schedule. Let's say maybe 8 o'clock, 
12 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the afternoon you'll have a snack, dinner might be 7 o'clock at night, and maybe a very light snack after dinner. When you agree to five eating times in a day, you, are, uh, you can set reminders on your computer, on your phone, on your watch, or uh, just paper pencil format just to remind yourself that you want to be eating on a schedule. Eating on a schedule is strategy number one. Strategy number two is redistributing your plate so that you're nailing the portion sizes. When you do this, you can't help but eat low carb and low calorie and low fat, all of those things that our livers really like. The other way that we do it as dietitians, so on the right hand part of this slide, this is an example of a structured meal plan that we were just talking about. Um, you know, breakfast and snacks are kind of all planned out. And the other thing that I would tell you is don't be afraid to use uh, some frozen meals or protein shakes even to augment your day. We call these meal replacements and we often see in the literature whenever we're trying to help people lose weight we uh, or control their blood sugars, when people substitute let's say one meal with something healthy and low sodium and low fat like perhaps maybe a smart ones frozen meal or uh, perhaps a kashi frozen meal uh, you can certainly talk with your doctor or dietitian about what frozen meals might work or you could bring homemade food and just eat in the proportion of the plate like I showed you on the previous slide when you're eating some very portion controlled, either ready to go meals or homemade leftovers that are in the right portion size, your calories will fall in line between 1200 to 1500 calories. Oftentimes my patients will say, but Beth, if I do like a Kashi frozen meal or uh, you know, a healthy choice frozen meal, aren't those high in sodium? They can be. Uh, and you want to look for ones that are lower in sodium, let's say maybe five or six hundred milligrams. But what I will also tell you is that those frozen meals usually, ironically, are lower in sodium than other healthy things that you could get. For example, a Subway turkey sandwich, six inch turkey sandwich, is about 1400 milligrams of sodium. And that oftentimes can be much higher than some healthy, uh, ready-to-go meals. So these aren't for everyone. Not everybody's palate likes those. But if you're interested in integrating some of these kind of frozen meals to augment your weight loss, these are not something that are, are uh, uh, they're not a bad idea. And you can definitely talk with your doctor or a dietitian about how to do that. The other thing that I'd like to mention is uh, I'd love for you to also try to integrate a little bit of soluble fibers into your diet. And this is mostly for um, blood sugar control, although there's some other kind of benefits to it as well. It helps blood sugars and it helps cholesterol. Many of our patients who struggle with fatty liver often also have high cholesterol and high blood sugars. So when we're talking about kind of picking the right foods, I also would like to suggest that integrating maybe a few beans or uh, a packet of instant oats with no added sugar or maybe a spoonful of flaxseed onto your meal or into maybe a fruit smoothie or adding some other fruits like citrus fruits, for example. These are all excellent ways to improve soluble fiber. So think of soluble fiber as a type of fiber that creates a gel in your intestine. That gel helps to kind of hold some of the bad cholesterol in it and it helps you eliminate that when you use the bathroom. Although things like Metamucil count as soluble fiber and those can be helpful in lower cholesterol, we really see the biggest bang for our buck when we look at foods. So just to review, soluble fibers are often found in fruits and beans, barley and flax seeds. Soluble fibers help you feel fuller longer. They reduce your cholesterol. They have been shown to improve symptoms of bloating and constipation associated with irritable bowel if any of you struggle with that and they also seem to improve insulin resistance. So at, if you're picking cereals, oatmeal is a great option. If you're looking to add some of these specific foods into your diet, these are wonderful complements to your healthy eating plan. 
I'd also like to suggest that when you are trying to limit calories or you're trying to eat on a structured meal plan, that it's really important to kind of wa to watch what you're eating and to have some sense of awareness. You know, when people write down what they're eating, they're absolutely more successful than when they don't. And there's all types of ways that you can do that. You can track what you're eating on a piece of paper uh, in a spiral bound notebook if you like. You could take pictures of it on your phone. Or you could download some free apps. Uh, you could use it on your phone or website, but there are all kinds of uh, resources here I listed for you. Things like My Fitness Pal, Lose It, Spark People, um, My Food Diary, Live Strong. These are all free resources that you can put on your phone or computer that allow you to track what you're eating and they give you kind of instant calorie feedback on how many calories you've had in the course of the day. This is helpful because when people track in real time, they're not only more aware of what they're eating, it may influence or kind of stop you from eating something you wish you uh, hadn't eaten, and it also helps keep you accountable. Many times my clients will say, well, I know if I have to write it down that I'm just not going to want to eat it. Let's switch gears and talk about how to integrate exercise into your regimen. So when we talk about exercise, we are looking at both aerobic exercise and weight training. So I showed you a slide earlier in our discussion about how most of us 50 plus Americans are not getting enough exercise. In fact, we're not even close to the target set up. Most of us are not getting uh, any exercise outside of kind of going to work and coming home. So on the other hand, some of you may have issues related to uh, orthopedic injuries or you may have uh, pain or bad backs. So I want to kind of preface this discussion of exercise by saying make sure that you have a chance to talk with your doctor first about uh, if you can get started on a weight loss program. If some of you are in physical therapist or know a physical therapist, you could also consult their perspective. But let's talk about what types of exercise seem to be helpful for liver health as well as for uh, blood sugar um, control and uh, liver health overall. So here's an interesting tip. Resistance training, which means building muscle, reduces liver fat even if you don't lose weight. There have been several studies looking at this. And even when weight loss stays relatively constant, when you build muscle, your triglycerides improve and your blood sugars improve, usually because the muscles are starting to use a little bit more fat and sugar rather than the liver having to deal with it all. Well, the ultimate goal of exercise is 30 minutes um, on most days of the week, maybe five days a week, you could also look at splitting that up differently so that you are achieving 150 minutes a week. Earlier in the 1990s, there was a groundbreaking study called the Diabetes Prevention Trial that demonstrated that people could prevent becoming type 2 diabetic if they were able to integrate walking for 30 minutes, five days a week, and if they were able to lose about 7% of their body weight. That kind of weight loss helps blood sugars and helps cholesterol and it also helps your liver. But even if you're not able to get there right out of the gates, some studies have shown that even one to three times of exercise a month seems to reduce some insulin resistance. While that's not ideal, it, it absolutely is an excellent start for some of you who feel like uh, exercise has not been a regular part of your daily routine. Don't forget that breaking exercise up into smaller segments actually helps you achieve the same goals. Some of my patients will start commuting and they'll uh, count their walk to the train rather than taking the bus. Uh, they get a mile in in the morning and maybe a mile in at the end of the day and they are breaking their exercise up over the course of the day as part of their commute. That's a wonderful way for you to get the benefits of exercise without having to feel like you're carving out 30 minutes a day. If you're interested in doing some weight training, these are a couple of things that you can get started with. And I want to kind of 
you know, plant the seed that uh, these are things that you could talk about with your doctor or your physical therapist if you happen to be working with somebody. I uh, don't get any, you know, I'm not affiliated with these companies at all. Uh, these just happen to be good exercise programs that I think uh, are excellent and that some of my clients have used with good results and generally are also very safe. So on the bottom here, we have kind of a walking tracker, a Fitbit, but you could use a Garmin, you could use an Apple Watch. And these have really exploded in the last couple of years. It seems like everybody has a Fitbit. Uh, jokingly, sometimes my patients will tell me they're expensive jewelry, that they wear them and they don't always use them to track their steps. But old-fashioned walking outside using something like a Fitbit to see how you're doing is, a, is one excellent way to get started, at least aerobically. The ultimate goal is to get you up to about 10,000 steps a day. Uh, but if you, the first thing I would suggest is see where you're at in your typical day. And if you're at two or 3,000 steps, try to set a goal for yourself to slowly increase yourself maybe 1,000 steps extra uh, per day per week. If you're looking at uh, trying to get some weight training in, uh, there are, depending on your level of activity, there are a couple of options that I have listed here. The sit and be fit workout, there, this happens to be a kind of an arthritis workout, but there's ones for bone health, uh, for breathing issues, um, for strength and flexibility. And this started on WTTW, or the public access channel. It's run by a kind of a nurse and her daughter, and there have been um, studies looking at the safety and the efficacy of these strength training programs for people who have uh, significant orthopedic uh, issues. So you can check those out. Walk away the pound that's listed here is a walking, in-home walking exercise video that you can walk up to one, two, three, four miles and you can use some light resistance bands. Uh, these are excellent, they're safe, they're great for those of you who want to work out in your house <coughs> and they're an excellent way to start exercising and improving your overall fitness without leaving home. The other two options that are listed here are one is kind of a Tai Chi balance yoga type exercise and the other one is called 10 minute trainer it was developed these are both found on beachbody.com and um, 10 minute trainer was developed by Tony Horton who's the guy behind P90X and the idea is that you're not using um, heavy weights you're just using resistance bands and that you are doing exercises that are split up into 10 minute segments so if you only have 10 minutes to do weight training a day, great, we'll take it. If you can do 10 minutes in the morning and 10 minutes in the evening, you've accumulated 20 minutes of strength training. That's excellent. So what I usually suggest to my clients is that they need a mix of movement, things to get the heart rate going, whether it's walking, swimming, biking, or you know something more formal if you're a runner, great. I also like for people to start integrating some strength training because when you build muscle, the muscle really likes to utilize some of the fats and sugars so the liver doesn't have to do that. These are just a couple of options, uh, but if any of you belong to a gym or a YMCA, you should inquire about some of the weight training and strength training programs that they have that might be appropriate for you given your you know, health and fitness level because any level of strength training that you can start to integrate if you haven't may have significant payouts for you. Let's shift gears here and uh, the, the next few slides that I have are designed to answer some specific questions that my patients will often ask me about supplements. Uh, there are other supplements that we can talk about as well. If any of you have questions, you know, feel free to let us know. We'll be happy to entertain them. Um, I often am asked about whether or not I, a patient should take a probiotic. And um, what I, I, I will answer that in a couple of ways. The short answer is, it does not appear to be harmful for you to take a probiotic, and in fact, it may be beneficial. I will cut to the chase and tell you that I don't think that we have very specific data yet to say which particular strain 
uh, based on which particular digest, uh, liver disease that we want to be considering. But probiotics are live bacteria that seem to create some benefit for you. And we have good bacterial strains that live in our intestines. Um, they're part of our um, actual bowel health. And the thought is that when you have liver disease, when you have cirrhosis, uh, that the bacteria in the gut are um, creating compounds that can work against your overall health. So the question has been, how do we modify gut bacteria? You know, while physicians sometimes have used antibiotics to manipulate gut bacteria, the question remains, can we use diet and can we use supplements like probiotics? Some of the probiotics uh, that I have pictured here have been studied. Uh, cultural, all of these you can find in a regular drugstore, a line, flora store. And Culturel, all of these are kind of over the counter. They don't need to be refrigerated. And uh, I would consult your physician if you're interested in looking at integrating a probiotic into your, uh, into your plan. Although these generally are safe and don't have side effects, it's always best to make sure that this is exactly the right thing for you. Specifically, probiotics have been studied in patients who have cirrhosis and can have high ammonia levels. And the kind of trend is that probiotic supplementation seems to reduce the uh, amount of ammonia made or some of the um, changes that can occur in the brain related to really advanced um, cirrhosis. I will also tell you that diet is one of the best ways that you can grow good bacteria, so to speak. Good bacteria thrive when you eat fruits and vegetables and when you eat some of those soluble fibers that we talked about, things like beans and oats, um, whole, whole grains uh, like barley, well as uh, citrus fruits. There are certain bad bacterial strains that do very well when we're eating a lot of refined sugar and a lot of high fat dairy foods like you know ice cream and heavy cream, etc. So while it, it may be very beneficial to integrate a probiotic, definitely does not appear to be harmful, I bet you'll get more bang for your buck if you change your diet and really focus on integrating some of those whole grains, fruits and vegetables, and going after some of the animal fats that may be lingering in your diet. The other question that my patients often ask me is, should they use milk thistle? Milk thistle is a supplement that you can get over the counter, and it has oftentimes been um, suggested as a great way to kind of cleanse the liver or heal the liver. There are lots of studies looking at milk thistle. Um, what I will tell you before we kind of talk about the bottom line is that milk thistle is a supplement. In fact, anytime we're talking about supplements, vitamins, herbal therapies, keep in mind that none of these are regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. So one of the criticisms of using supplements and herbal therapies has always been, can we trust the dose and the efficacy of these probiotics, uh, uh, have these vitamin levels of these uh, herbal therapies like milk thistle that we, we would be using. So <clears throat> generally using over-the-counter milk thistle does not appear to be harmful. There was <clears throat> a recent kind of cumulative statement um, put out by, summary statement put out by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. And I will tell you, I'm not recommending milk thistle. I typically like my patients to focus on diet and exercise and weight loss as a way to clean the liver. But if you're interested in this, I would talk with your doctor about it. Many studies actually have looked at uh, milk thistle. There's 16 prospective clinical trials. It's hard to get a consistent bottom line because all of those clinical trials were a little bit different. In general, most of these trials seem to improve liver enzyme function. Very few of these studies looked at outcomes and longevity, meaning did our patients with liver disease live longer when they used milk thistle? 
Uh, there was one study that said it looked like it improved longevity and one that said that it didn't. So we don't really have a kind of a consensus or an agreement on that. There are some side effects from milk thistle. Most people report headaches, nausea, kind of GI side effects, but these are generally uh, more of a, a nuisance or um, something that are considered mild and not, um, and not extremely significant. I will caution you, there's no bottom line yet on whether or not we can routinely and systematically recommend milk thistle for our patients with liver disease and especially fatty liver. The mechanism of how milk thistle works is not fully understood. There are some suggestions of how it works um, and potentially as an antioxidant to the liver, but they're not completely understood. So like I said in summary here, when we are considering all of these therapies together and we think about what's going to give you the most bang for your buck in terms of improving liver health, weight loss to the tune of 5 to 10 percent is going to be your best liver cleanse. Uh, I'm not a fan of juice cleanses and kind of short-lived fasts or apple cider vinegar diets or even baked potato diets or some of the very trendy things that are happening right now. We know that when our patients have fatty liver, we want them to lose weight, and we don't want them to lose weight drastically. That might actually work against your liver health as well. So to summarize our best practice here, if you can think about losing 5 to 10% of your body weight to control blood sugars or to control blood pressure, um, the fat around your midsection or your high blood pressure or cholesterol, you can do that by focusing on shaving calories, really watching out for added sugars. Think about where desserts and sugary drinks and coffees and so forth come into your diet and think about how you can limit those to one a day or completely get rid of them all together. Get yourself on an eating pattern where you're designating five times a day to eat. Work on adding in exercise if you're not already. If you're already walking and doing cardiovascular exercise, that's excellent. Focus on bringing weights into the picture and consider using one of the simple kind of uh, easily found weight training uh, exercise videos that I'm offering to you, but also check at your gym or your YMCA or talk with your doctor about what might be the best way for you to get started on a weight training program. Use portion control, controlled strategies to eat less, such as that plate method or buying things that are all portion controlled like cheese sticks and individual yogurts so that you know you're nailing the portion size right out of the gates. And then finally, uh, it's, it is always worth repeating that if you're drinking regular soda, kick it to the curb. Look at drinking water, unsweetened iced tea or seltzer water. And generally, whenever we're talking about liver health, we like for our patients to avoid alcohol. If you would like to discuss that specifically with your physician, please do so. But as a, as a blanket statement, we would avoid alcohol and sodas because they really do put extra stress on the liver. Finally, what I will say is that the opportunity here to improve your liver health is I, I want to kind of suggest that we think about diet in a really positive light. It's very easy for our patients to feel like they uh, are giving up all of their favorite things. What I would like for you to think about is all of the things that you need to be eating in the course of the day to promote liver wellness. So you might think about, I've got to get enough fruits and vegetables in in the course of the day. Uh, I've got to make sure that I get a serving of oatmeal in every day if I can. I'd like to get some uh, kind of healthy nuts or nut butters in there in the course of the day. And when you start thinking about all of the positive things that you need to be eating, it changes your perspective and doesn't make nutrition quite so punitive. It makes it a little bit more empowering. If you feel like you would starting with diet and exercise at once is too much, I would suggest get started with exercise. Healthy behaviors cluster. And when you feel like you have a regular exercise regimen, you may feel like this opens the door for you wanting to continue to make changes with your diet and lifestyle program. Thank you for joining us today. And I hope that there are some strategies here that you're able to integrate into your wellness plan.
please let us know if you have specific nutrition questions.